All right. Um, so just intros, I'm Mahidar Tatineli. I lead the user services group at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, which is at UCSD. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about uh, the national research platform. Um, this is something that uh, I think our director, Frank Berthwein, had given an update maybe a couple of years ago at the same conference. And so I'm gonna give you uh, some info on what's, uh, what's new in the past couple of years and what's kind of what's our goal moving forward and how things look. So <clears throat> the National Research Platform uh, essentially is aiming to be an open cyber infrastructure for research and education. Uh, so uh, originally uh, this came out of the PRP, the Pacific Research Platform uh, program. Uh, and the ch uh, challenges that we are trying to address are uh, basically, one is there's a gap between uh, people who have a lot of CI resources and a lot of people uh, uh, to manage them and uh, to handle them like at big universities versus somebody who might be at a, at a small institution where they still need a lot of need for uh, uh, research computing and education resources but can't afford to manage something like that. So we were trying to address part of this by having an infrastructure that's open where they can join and uh, maybe get access to something more than uh, what's at their uh, institution. Uh, so we're trying to essentially also bridge the gap between what you need between at a classroom level for teaching classes and, and the research scale of computing. The other thing that's uh, uh, happening is uh, uh, in, uh, as you, as you uh, go towards the end of Moore's law, essentially uh, you're seeing lots of new innovative architectures, especially like, you know, targeted architectures for particular domains. Uh, and from a uh, adoption perspective, it's getting a little harder for the domain scientists to kind of use something like this uh, because either they need like specialized resources to run something like that, or there's a risk to even buying some new architecture and not knowing you know, how that works. And one of the things we want to do uh, on the NRP is to kind of integrate some of these research, uh, plot, research uh, level architectures into, uh, into general availability so that people can try them out and also even for us to kind of experiment and see what works and what doesn't. So it's a good platform for those sort of things. So uh, the slides, I mean, I'm gonna talk about things that are ideas and our vision to what, of what we want to do, some R&D stuff, and then existing production stuff. So it's all labeled that way. So uh, in terms of the vision of an open architecture, we're looking to uh, integrate both horizontally and, verti uh, and vertically, and what do I mean by that? Basically, uh, at the horizontal level, we, we are trying to grow the uh, Kubernetes cluster that is uh, NRP uh, uh, by letting institutions integrate their own resources into it. Uh, and vertically, we are essentially building projects on top of this infrastructure. So there's two different directions. So the long-term vision, and uh, if you've heard Frank talk, you've probably seen this slide a few times, <laughs> is uh, is to create an open uh, national cyber infrastructure that lets you federate CI at a lot of different in institutions, uh, conceivably all the way up to uh, the 4,000 uh, <coughs> degree granting higher education institutions. Uh, so in terms of open infrastructure, we are looking for open compute, storage, and also devices and instruments uh, plugging into them. Uh, so in terms of the institutions themselves, they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, if you look at the distribution across the country, they come in with uh, uh, institutions with a few hundreds of students to uh, institutions with tens of thousands of students. And the resources that come with them are also as varied, right? Uh, this is just a slide. Uh, uh, so say, why, why do you want to do something like this? It's because you could get somebody uh, doing interesting research at 
at a small institution, and if they don't have access to resources, it, you might lose someone very important. So, uh, so we are hoping that we can open up the infrastructure and make it easier to access, so that you know more people can do research or even uh, uh, play around with uh, the educational side of it. Uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, how we want to enable this is, is essentially we are not trying to have a single project that's funded to do this, right? Uh, that's uh, uh, almost not possible at this scale. So what we're trying to do is have a community with a shared vision and then uh, have participating projects that add resources or people or uh, you know training material or lots of uh, different ways to contribute to uh, NRP. Uh, and uh, if you look at NRP as it stands now in production, uh, there are resources funded by the NSF, the DOD, DOE, uh, all kinds of different uh, state-sponsored uh, 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 systems and, and nodes. It could be a single node that's sitting in uh, an institution somewhere that's added in. And uh, once we have this shared infrastructure, we've built services on top, like the Open Science Data Federation. And, and these are projects that are not directly uh, funded by NRP or part of NRP, it's more uh, uh, something that makes use of uh, the infrastructure to essentially enable this. Uh, and then we have uh, some that are in the R&D kind of phase, the fusion data platform and uh, the nat national data platform are, uh, are funded research projects that are actually building on top of uh, uh, this infrastructure. Uh, so today's talk, I'm just gonna look at the challenges addressed by NRP, but using AI as a lens because that's essentially what's driving a lot of uh, uh, resource uh, uh, consumption in, in most institutions right now. Uh, but the challenges are a lot more general than this and uh, uh, we should, I should say that much more than AI runs on NRP. So. Now from an AI perspective, uh, this is a plot uh, that kind of shows the percentage of large scale AI results from academia. And if you look at this uh, from, from, for just the pre-training and the training part of it, uh, as you can uh, imagine, uh, the resources required to do something like this uh, are well beyond academia right now, like in terms of the scales of uh, uh, tens of thousands of GPUs running for months kind of thing, right? So it's uh, very uh, kind of obvious from, uh, from the number of uh, the percentage of large-scale AI results that uh, that part is uh, is kind of uh, becoming difficult, uh, but uh, everything else that goes with uh, AI is within reach of uh, most of academia and can be done on an infrastructure like uh, the NRP. Uh, so, like if you want fine-tuning or uh, uh, modeling on top of that reinforcement learning and so on. Like the things that are possible uh, with a few hundred GPU hours say, right? So, and the, but uh, with the prevalence of all these uh, AI driven workloads, this is essentially has redefined the uh, architecture needs. Majority of the US colleges uh, won't have the resources to afford a data center to kind of set something up like this. Uh, or if they have the uh, resources, uh, even keeping up with the modern uh, AI hardware becomes a little difficult. Uh, uh, and basically from the cost point of view and also from the people to manage something like this, right? So we, we're aiming to essentially use NRP as an attempt to kind of uh, manage this for uh, smaller institutions and kind of expand uh, uh, the access to a lot more people. So how does NRP work? Basically, it's a flexible architecture that lets you build uh, on horizontally and vertically. Uh, in terms of, uh, depending on how much effort uh, your institution or your uh, site can uh, put in, and the amount of control you want. Of course, you know, some people might want a lot of control, some might 
say, okay, you can take access at the IPMI level, so it really depends. Uh, you can essentially join in at the level you're comfortable. Uh, so uh, from our perspective, we can come in at the uh, IPMI firmware and BIOS level. So if someone gives us IPMI access to a node and they have the networking to kind of be able to join uh, the cluster, we can manage it from that point on. Uh, so the way it works is we, we install the OS and uh, put in the Kubernetes layer to kind of integrate to the major, ma the, the big uh, Kubernetes cluster that's distributed. Uh, now some people will manage the OS level themselves and give us uh, access at the Kubernetes layer. Or some people will say, okay, I, I don't even want to give you that. Uh, they want to federate their Kubernetes cluster with ours, which is also fine. Uh, and then at the highest level, uh, the open science grid path kind of approach where you federate existing batch uh, and storage uh, via that. So, uh, yeah, uh, so everything is kind of in a single Kubernetes cluster. So the uh, NRP is essentially a non-local extendable container deployment platform, if you think of it that way. Uh, now, it gives us a lot more flexibility beyond uh, uh, a traditional kind of like a slurm cluster in a data center in terms of the environment and persistent services and uh, other things. So it's a little different from a management point of view and like coming from uh, and my background, I came from the HPC side of uh, things and I still manage the user support for a lot of uh, our big HPC clusters. So this is a little different in terms of what's capable, uh, what is possible on the system, uh, but gives a lot more flexibility uh, to do interesting things. Uh, and uh, the Open Science Data Federation, essentially uh, data is stored at origins or across the country. Uh, and. Uh, Basically, we have caches uh, at various points in the network so that uh, you're close enough to a cache uh, from any point in the country. And uh, the NRP uh, added a lot of uh, these resources into the. And the institutions join, as I said, at the batch or at the storage system layer, uh, combining uh, both the storage and compute side, we have over 150 institutions right now uh, in the NRP. And that kind of shows you the hardware locations uh, across, uh, across the country. So um, originally this came out of the PRP uh, project as I mentioned, uh, and the Nautilus cluster has been the Kubernetes infrastructure for PRP for over five years uh, before uh, last year. And what we did is leverage that to say, hey, this is a good idea. We're seeing a lot of adoption across various campuses and we wanted to continue this uh, for a longer term. And that uh, essentially led to a successful category two proposal to NSF and I'll talk about what that is. So the category two systems, uh, uh, traditionally, they're kind of on-prem clusters with HPC or with interesting uh, architectures that run for five years and longer. Uh, and what we did is uh, 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 did a similar uh, proposal, but uh, for the uh, for adding resources to this existing Kubernetes uh, resource. Uh, what, uh, what we ended up doing was uh, introduce a lot of different hard, new hardware options. So there's composable hardware in PNRP now, uh, which uh, we have FPGAs and GPUs that can be composed into, uh, uh, into a node. So this is a uh, PCIe extendable uh, composition. So you can, def you can essentially make a node dynamically composed of uh, different kinds of uh, hardware. Uh, but that's one uh, level of innovation, but we also uh, uh, made available a lot of uh, FE32 GPUs that are kind of the core of a lot of uh, uh, AI development work that, uh, that was happening already. So uh, all of this ended up in the same infrastructure. Uh, so 
as I mentioned, the CAT2 program from NSF, it uh, essentially uh, is a program to uh, support novel systems. Uh, the category one systems are more uh, heavy production, uh, uh, traditional clusters that, uh, that, uh, that are used by a lot of uh, researchers already. But this is more of a novel system, uh, either in the system design or in the hardware. In our case, it was both, because it's kind of the first time someone was pitching something like this. Uh, so there's a three-year test bed phase, which is what we are in with right now with NRP, uh, with the prototype national research pro uh, platform. And during this time, we are essentially working out like you know, how people can use it, uh, what are the pieces that need uh, software development or uh, development of policies or uh, lots of uh, 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 work with early users and uh, testbed users to kind of figure out what works and what doesn't. After the first three year uh, testbed period, there'll be a two year allocation period where it will behave more like a regular allocated NSF system. So, um, so the, uh, what this uh, led to was essentially uh, addition of uh, the HPC resources that are uh, basically 32 FPGAs. Uh, these are uh, Xilinx uh, 55, X55C uh, FPGAs, uh, sorry, U55Cs, and then 288 A10 uh, GPUs and uh, 64 A100 uh, GPUs with 80 gigs each, which are really popular with the AI people. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, we have a distributed data infrastructure. So we uh, essentially have 50 terabytes of NVMe cache in eight different locations, and we have distributed them so that uh, any, any site in the US is within 500 miles of that cache, essentially. And then we have origins which have uh, a combined four and a half petabytes across uh, three sites. Uh, and I mentioned the composable system uh, aspect of it. And that's quite a, kind of the summary of each site, so I'll skip that. So the question might be, how, how do people access all of this? Well, Nautilus is a Kubernetes cluster. Logins are managed uh, using CI logon. Uh, and Basically, we uh, we set up namespaces, or we we give users namespace admin. If you are the PI of a project, or if you are managing the re uh, projects in your lab or particular project, you can be the namespace admin, and then add other people into that allocation uh, that are at your site. So uh, all of that uh, authentication piece is all through CI logon. Uh, so institutions can essentially enforce their own rules. Uh, most of them are using two-factor already. So, And we don't transfer any passwords to PNRP, only the OAuth talk tokens from CI logon. So that's kind of uh, just the access piece is quite easy in that sense. Uh, for example, uh, on a traditional HPC cluster, we would have an allocation process with uh, people having to write proposals and then uh, once a PI gets allocated time, they, then they can add other users to that, and then that sends a packet to all the site that's uh, getting your allocation, and then we set up accounts and passwords and all those sort of things. So that uh, is a lot simplified in this case. And uh, you can essentially ac access this cluster from any laptop or desktop if you have a kubectl installed and download the config file once you're logged in, and that's pretty much all you need. You don't actually need a login node in that sense. Uh, so with uh, NRP, what we were aiming to do was to bridge education and research by having everything exist on one platform. So a lot of the smaller colleges that we've uh, expanded to, like the Cal States, for example, care more about the educational use than the research use, because uh, they might have a lot of students who just uh, are part of a class that are using these resources. Um, and having a resource like this uh, lets them start out in a classroom setting in, uh, uh, easily, but then if they want to 
uh, scale out and try something at, at the research level, they can. And uh, we've seen that happen at a few Cal States already, where uh, you have the students and then you ended up uh, doing some research in the uh, later uh, part of your student career. So in terms of NRP as an AI platform, uh, so we added 288 G uh, GPUs, A10 GPUs and 64 A100. Uh, but if you go look at uh, what's on the cluster right now, they're uh, uh, way more uh, in terms of accelerators. So we have over 1,200 uh, uh, accelerators or GPUs on, on the cluster. It's because people from various institutions have been adding their own resources in. Uh, and that essentially leads to uh, almost, a, uh, I think it's 4x of what we put in is in the system. So, uh, which makes it pretty attractive if you're starting out and you want to try out your uh, AI workloads. It's a good place to go uh, try things. Uh, so, uh, I have a few slides on what people have done uh, with these resources. So, uh, uh, basically, at, at the recent 5 NRP conference, which was last week uh, at UCSD, uh, the science speakers uh, all were basically using NRP as a research resource. So, they uh, used uh, close to 400,000 GPU hours in the last six months and uh, close to 6 million CPU hours in the last six months. So. Uh, uh, it's quite heavy usage, and if you look at the kinds of work uh, workloads that were run, it's uh, pretty broad-based in terms of application areas. So we had uh, uh, applications where basically uh, using AI for wireless sensing and communication. This was essentially for self-driving cars. Uh, some people using it for uh, uh, industrial AI for manufacturing, uh, basically digital twins kind of uh, approach. Uh, humanoid robots. So, so some of this is uh, 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 at UCSD, but a lot of the work uh, is all across the country in all sorts of institutions. So, so there's quite a bit of research work on NRP. Uh, and this was true even in the uh, uh, early user period for our NRP edition, which was all these new GPUs and uh, FPGAs. And it wasn't just AI, I mean, I'm not sure how visible this is, but basically we had uh, uh, fusion energy research, uh, ice cube neutrino, neutrino observatory work, uh, uh, basically uh, genomics and so on, on on the system. So it's quite uh, varied use cases. Uh, also like, uh, in addition to the research use, there's also uh, quite a bit of use of uh, uh, NRP for AI education. So University of Oklahoma, uh, uh, they actually presented at CNI a couple of years ago. Uh, they built the research and education platform in NRP. And they actually, uh, now the Great Plains uh, engine, GP engine, essentially built a regional compute cluster across seven states. Uh, that's a recent addition, essentially, uh, to, the, to the NRP. Hardware is mostly GPUs, uh, but it's got a strong focus on sub supporting STEM education, especially AI-related STEM education. Uh, we also had a, a scenic AI resource, a collaboration between the uh, California's re region, regional uh, research and education network, NRP, and multiple Cal State universities that uh, was focused on AI research. This has also got an NSF award uh, called TIDE, the Technology Infrastructure for Data Exploration. Uh, again, this uh, added compute resources into the uh, NRP. <coughs> and these are, uh, uh, the CSU system is quite uh, extensive, uh, focused on a lot of higher education. Uh, up, kind of uh, workloads on, on the system. So the GP engine uh, uh, has a similar kind of uh, uh, goal, basically computer science undergraduate classes, 
uh, HPC classes and undergraduate data science classes and and so on. So, and uh, this sort of approach has been also kind of taken up at uh, UCSD. If you look at educational computing at UCSD, and I want to say all of this is not on uh, NRP alone. Like it's basically uh, they have a cluster which kind of uh, replicates the Kubernetes-based approach, and uh, they are, uh, basically operate a modest-sized cluster for use in classroom. But you can see uh, over the years there's been a growth of both uh, uh, the number of courses using AI and uh, the number of students. I think that's uh, the scale. There is about 60 and 6,000 students. I think uh, so. There's uh, definitely uh, plenty of uh, uh, interest in using these sort of resources for uh, in classes. So, like, uh, for example, if you look at the spring of 2023, uh, several UCSD classes are used resources like this. So, there's uh, some are kind of obvious, the advanced computer vision and deep learning and applications and so on. But some are now going into uh, areas that are not traditionally associated with uh, computing, uh, like uh, for example, political science and some other areas are now, classes in those areas are uh, starting to use compute. Uh, so it's a pretty uh, uh, accelerating trend that like, you know, you're gonna have more and more classes dealing with this. And uh, with that comes the requirement for having the CI to be able to handle something like this. Uh, now for an institution like UCSD, they might be able to go set up a cluster of their own and do this, but it's not really possible for everyone. So uh, we're hoping an uh, NRP can fill the gap in institutions that need the help, essentially. Uh, so yeah, I think I, uh, I can probably, uh, basically if you look at the AI at UCSD on uh, SDSC systems, basically we have uh, uh, over 60 faculty across 23 departments uh, involved in this. So, and uh, there are the standard ones, but then there are uh, some that are like social sciences and uh, uh, oceanography and health sciences that are uh, you know new to all this, but it's growing. And essentially, it, all, all it says is we can't uh, ignore the needs of uh, all of these uh, departments because they're gonna grow. So from a platform perspective, yeah, we can, we can provide the uh, GPUs and since we are pulling in resources from all, uh, all our institutions, uh, we can uh, give uh, uh, a little bit of scale to in institutions that may not have those resources, that's one part of it. But the other aspect of NRP is uh, we want to essentially bring CS R&D and domain science R&D into the same platform. And uh, trying to essentially accelerate domain science adoption by doing this. So, uh, and you might be wondering why uh, this is needed, uh, well, uh, if you look at the performance uh, improvements versus time uh, with the traditional architectures, uh, it's essentially fallen off the cliff uh, uh, in terms of the growth because of uh, essentially hitting physical limits. So what's uh, sort of starting to happen with some of the domain sciences is they're coming up with applications optimized architectures. So. Uh, so at, at UCSD, uh, Professor Diana Rosing's group uh, essentially uh, uh, has the PRISM project essentially, which uh, develops a lot of these uh, applications on uh, FPGAs uh, that uh, essentially let you uh, uh, come up with a dynamic architecture that's optimized for your particular domain. Uh, but to experiment with something like this uh, requires, you know, A, the hardware like FPGAs and everything, and then the knowledge to kind of be able to take advantage of these uh, interesting hardware pieces. Uh, so in RP, we've kind of made it a point to add a lot of these resources like FPGAs and P4 switches and NVIDIA DPUs and so on. Uh, so that it's sort of a 
playground for someone who wants to try these out. And hopefully we build a community as that's going on, like for example with FPGAs, you're seeing some use with the bioinformatics community and some use with the physics community in terms of uh, using them for uh, particular problems. As we build that community, hopefully we'll get more people using these unique resources. So uh, some of the things uh, uh, that we are uh, trying out uh, on NRP uh, storage devices with FPG embedded FPGAs, so that's like computational storage. GPUs on uh, network in in inference cards, uh, interface cards, sorry. Uh, so data flow programming, programmable switches, and so on. And all of these, uh, we couldn't really test in our traditional setup. Like I say, if you want to stick this in a HPC cluster, you're going to get a lot of objections. <laughs> but the way the architecture is uh, set up here, uh, since uh, with Kubernetes, we sort of can isolate some of these things to test uh, and come up with uh, unique environments uh, that live with the rest of the cluster, uh, that helps us uh, test some of these things. For example, with the FPGAs, uh, the way we've set these up uh, uh, with the Kubernetes uh, environment, uh, we can have the whole Xilinx stack in the, uh, available to you via actually our desktop, if you want, uh, uh, in the pod. So, uh, so people get a very uh, direct, uh, kind of access to using the FPGAs, but in a normal setting uh, that they are familiar with, so with the Xilinx tools and all, so on. Uh, now, I, putting that in our traditional cluster would be quite difficult because there's all these OS requirements that need to be uniform across everything. So with the containerized approach, it lets us do a lot of interesting things. So uh, we are hoping that uh, we can try out all these in this kind of environment so that uh, uh, there's more broader use of it. Uh, and uh, we've also kind of uh, got a pretty interesting uh, network infrastructure so we can peer at 400 gig and uh, uh, via our 400 gig arista switch. And uh, I think there was a recent test with uh, the help of Scenic uh, where we sustained 400 gig transfer between STSC and Caltech using X root D. So, uh, so we are even experimenting at the switch levels essentially. Uh, I want to say even with the FPGAs, I think there's some work uh, where uh, uh, we are uh, doing some networking tests using the FPGAs. So, uh, Overall, uh, it's a pretty ambitious thing we're trying trying to integrate at this huge scale with you know so many institutions, uh, trying to be horizontally open. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we put in about <clears throat> 400 GPUs, say, or 360 or 70 GPUs uh, into PNRP from the CAT2 award. But then, if you look at the number of GPUs that are in uh, uh, in RP, we are almost three x of that, uh, and uh, vertically also there have been several tools already built on top of an RP, and we are hoping that uh, this will uh, serve as a place to you know build uh, several research tools, uh, and then uh, you know they can be used. Uh, across the country since the uh, system is uh, distributed easily. Uh, and as I mentioned, we want to be a playground for uh, trying out new architectures and new software packages and new, uh, new combinations on the system so, so that uh, once they're kind of tested and if there is a solution, it can be easily used by domain scientists because it's essentially on the same platform. Uh, and we recognize that there's going to be a uh, increasingly uh, require, I mean, all, both research and education will increasingly require significant CI. I mean, looking at the number of classes that are pulling in compute and uh, AI uh, uh, into their curriculum, we're going to need a scalable architecture for that. So this is a great start to kind of trying to enable that, uh, but I think uh, over the 
course of next five years, the CAT2 system is supported for five years and this uh, NRP project is going to be supported under that. Hopefully we can grow in both resources and community engagement because I think the one other thing that I didn't mention is the people scalability, right? And having a, a community uh, approach to this, hopefully that scales too because, you know, you're sitting and trying to develop FPGA code uh, for domain scientists. I mean, it can't come out of one institution. It has to be uh, coming from a broad community. And we are hoping that we'll develop the community to kind of uh, go with the resource, resources that people are pitching in. Uh, and we've already seen this with uh, some of the uh, results with the classes, for example, like what, uh, uh, what Cal State uh, campuses did with their classes. Uh, more people are looking at that and saying, oh, we, sh we should try this on our side too. And, uh, hope and they're all helping each other. And if you were at the FIRE and RP conference, uh, there was a lot of discussion uh, within the community because uh, the solutions we come up with uh, need to be scalable and also be usable by uh, the entire uh, research and education community. So we all need community engagement to kind of get, keep that going at us in a scalable fashion. So that was a quick overview. Uh, of what NRP is and both from the resource point of view and from our vision point of view, what we want to do. Uh, I think I have about seven or eight minutes for questions, so thank you. Just how do the security parts of this work? Like, is there a, a standard that's applied across all the participants? Is there someone responsible for running that process? Can you talk about that a little bit? So, uh, uh, I think to join the cluster, there are uh, certain requirements, and uh, I might be the wrong person to ask the security question, but uh, uh, from a networking standpoint, I think, uh, and in terms of, uh, uh, so, and we have uh, like uh, user agreements on like uh, when you're running on them, but uh, I don't know if there's, I might have to get back to you on that question actually, because uh, policy wise, I'm in, yeah, I, I'll have to get back to you. On the authentication front, we are using CI logon and whatever two-factor that a particular uh, institution has that works fine. So, and one thing is, uh, since we are grabbing the node at the, either the IPMI level or the OS level, we can we maintain all the software, software that's required to be maintained from a security perspective. So that part is uh, under our control. So we are not running this on a system that we don't manage, essentially. Oh yeah, you had it. Um, are you um, experiencing any um, like institutional and private partnerships? So for instance, um, companies partnering with universities that are using their platform? No, not, uh, no, right now I don't, think there are any, you're, you're talking private companies, right? Talking private companies, uh, corporation, yeah. yeah, no, no, there is nothing, nothing directly like that. Uh, so typically with the NSF resources, uh, I think there's, uh, the restriction we have is that whatever product that comes out of it needs to be public, right? So, yeah. Well, let me ask um, a question that came up at the uh, 
at the workshop, um, just maybe to wrap us up here. Um, I wonder if you could uh, update the folks here a little bit on the NRP's prospective roles in the um, NSF pilot for the National AI Research Resource. Sure, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we definitely would, will be contributing in, uh, to the uh, NAIR pilot. Uh, and I think uh, our first inclination is I think we can contribute a lot on the education side, uh, making resources available. Uh, because from a scale perspective, uh, we, are, we are much smaller compared to, say, a cluster that is uh, uh, you know, dedicated for AI at a large scale. But, but from an educational perspective, we should be able to uh, contribute a lot, especially uh, you know, uh, enabling things like Jupyter Notebooks uh, for a classroom with a particular environment so that people can uh, uh, all work through the same uh, uh, educational pipeline, essentially. Uh, and I think uh, there was quite a bit of interest in, uh, so we actually, one thing I didn't mention is we basically have a uh, template to set up Jupyter Notebooks uh, uh, for either classrooms or for groups uh, with a particular uh, image if, uh, if you want to. And, uh, and we actually host a Jupyter Hub that uh, has uh, a set of standard images that most people actually just use those. And with the way we have set up that template is to, again, use CI logon for the authentication piece. And, and then, you know, a group can have uh, uh, a place to essentially launch all the notebooks they want with, with the particular image they want. And we actually have a a GitLab instance that lets you even build the images uh, if you want to, uh, and then deploy them onto an RP. So uh, I think that's one thing we would definitely uh, get involved in is at the education level. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, other AI aspects, like I mean, we can do fine tuning and uh, uh, you know uh, inference workloads, uh, but uh, there's gonna be a limit to the scale of what we can do given the resources we have. The classroom ones are a little easier to deal with because they're not continuously loaded, right? Uh, it's gonna be uh, usually tied to classes that, uh, and, uh, and the load is bursty, but you, you should be able to handle that. Thank you again. Thanks. <laughs>